All right, so now we are ready. So we will, we have, we will begin Haggai chapter 2 now, after exiting chapter 1. And chapter 2 is, quite not, the, uh, is not quite the uh, tiptoe through the garden as chapter 1 is. There is some imagery here that we have to deal with and, and understand, some, some prophecy. But, it's, but hopefully we can clear all that up. But the, we'll read the first nine verses. This breaks down, this chapter breaks down generally in three chunks, and so we'll start with the first nine. So Haggai chapter 2, verse 1. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And to the residue of the people, say, Who is left among you that saw the house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Now let us begin in prayer. O God, our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do give thee thanks for this day. We give thee thanks for this word. So many wonderful promises of thy presence with thy people. As, you, as Thou has lifts us up and sustains us through the labors that we have in Thy service. And we thank Thee for uh, being with us on the Lord's Day as we come together. Lord, we ask that Thou would remember those in these places like Afghanistan that are this Lord's Day that may not be able to meet openly again. And we ask that Thou would be with them in secret, and help them, and may they be strong and courageous and firm uh, in doing that which thou hast called them to do, even at the expense of life. And we pray that thou would continue with us in this nation, that we may have uh, liberty to meet as we do. And we pray these things in the name of our Savior and for his sake. Amen. And so in these first nine verses of this chapter two, we see it's another time frame given to us. We are uh, given the dates in the first verse, and and you'll find if you read through Haggai, it kind of goes that way. You have uh, various dates and mentions of dates, and that kind of breaks the text up because it gives us markers as to when Haggai is called forth to come and bring a message to the people. And and this is one that is greatly needed. And, And so... Uh, They are currently under discouragement, and the Lord sends his messenger to them that they may be encouraged to work. Now, uh, what we have here is we see that life in the the Lord's service is uh, now uh, we see what it is. It's not, uh, there are sometimes difficulties and discouragements. It's not all roses and butterflies and good days. Um, that's the false gospel. That's the, the prosperity gospel. This is uh, what we witness here in our text with the Israelites. They have, of course, obeyed the commandment of the Lord. We, we read that in the previous chapter in verses 12 through 15. Uh, they, they come to repentance, they obey the Lord, and they go to work. But now here comes discouragement. And, of course, Satan always loves to uh, darken our thoughts and our minds and get us to put off the work of the Lord. 
And he, can do, he will do it as any way that he can find uh, an opening. And so we have that even here in the Israelites. So they hadn't began the work very long, but now the work is in jeopardy before it even gets started good. And so we, we will currently examine that. Uh, Israel becomes discouraged, but the Lord sends his messenger with a message of encouragement. And the Lord uh, is gracious in that way and merciful. And, and often we need these things. We need these reminders. As we will see, just like he says in verse 4, I am with you. Well, he says the same thing in the previous chapter in verse 13. So this short period of time we find twice over he's saying, I'm with you. Do not fear. And so we often need these messages to be brought to our attention because we are a forgetful people. And even in the midst of trials and tribulations, we forget even quicker. Um, this is a word in, re, uh, in season to keep them firm in their work. This is life in the Lord's service, and we, we do acknowledge this. And, and we, we sometimes need encouraging words to keep us, to keep us steady on the path. And we look to the Lord for these things. We look to his word. So let us see now um, how the Lord encourages his people. And we will see in two ways here. The first is he, uh, there will be, we see the problem as it is uh, presented to us. It's a season of discouragement. But then we see how he encourages with his presence. And then we see further how he encourages with the fact uh, uh, that he will glorify this house. The, the problem was the people were saying that this house is not going to be as glorious as the old house. But then the Lord encourages them with the fact that of what he is going to do with that house and how he will glorify it. And, and so we begin with the seasons of discouragement in verses 1 through 3. And we see very quickly that in, in this time frame, that in the seventh month, we just left the sixth month and 24th day of the sixth month. So about roughly a month, three to four weeks, uh, in verse 15 of chapter 1, in the fourth and 20, 20th day of the sixth month. So that's when the work was beginning to progress on the temple. And then now we see very quickly, within three or four weeks, that the people are having problems. But the Lord has already sensed the problem. And so he sends his messenger with a, with a sermon. And so this establishes us a fresh time frame uh, 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 where he is coming and bringing this sermon and he preaches to them in verse 2. He shows how often, we need, uh, how often we need this input from the Lord. As I was saying in the introduction, we, we quickly forget the helps that we have in his service we, we quickly forget what he's done for us in the past. That's why we often must count our blessings, as that uh, song says, the old hymn. And we, we look to the, words, the uh, Lord's word for this. He, he helps us in his word as to our service. He directs us from his word. And he also there is, uh, shows us that, there, that he is there for our time of need. Through his word, we, we have all these things encapsulated in the word of God. And this is what, what we have. <clears throat> we don't have prophets now because that's, the canon of scripture is closed. But we still have Haggai speaking to us today. And we still come to the same discouragements as the people of Israel. Now, in this coming back, they repented, they began the work, and then what, we, what do we find with them? It's not very long before they hit a patch, an obstacle. And so that's what we're dealing with here. So Haggai sent, Haggai speaks to all the people, not just the leadership. In verse 2 and then in verse 3, we see what the problem is. He calls it out very directly. And what, what is the problem, or, and who is the problem, is what we're going to deal with next. Uh, and let's look at verse, uh, Ezra three, uh, chapter 3, excuse me, verse 12. And this gives us those whom are causing the current, the, the current concern. <clears throat> and the first four ver uh, chapters of Ezra is really the background to where 
Haggai is ministering. So uh, if you ever want to go and, and read a companion to Haggai, if you're ever studying in Haggai, this is where you would go, Haggai and Zechariah. And so the first four chapters kind of detail that time frame within the 20-year span between when they arrived back from Babylonian captivity and then to this point in Haggai. So uh, Ezra chapter 3, verse 12. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had, been, that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. So that the people could not discern the noise, verse 13, of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. And so the ones that have caused the ruckus now are some of these ancient of time. Now this would be 20 years in the future from this point after they laid the foundation. So more than likely the the uh, descriptor of many is probably not applicable at this point because many of those had probably passed off the scene into glory, but you still have some of these men that would be late 70s, early 80s that would have been in this original group that had seen the glory of the original temple. And, and so now, because they are um, ancient men, uh, they, they are elders in the community, they would be the ones that the young ones would take directive from and take directions, and, and counsel. And they were the ones saying, they were uh, questioning the adequacy of the current temple and what they were gonna, how they were going to build it. And of course, this was causing a problem back in our text. They were looking at it through the lens of Solomon's temple. And we've read the accounts in Kings and, and Chronicles of the grandness of that temple. It had overlays of gold all on the inside, uh, all the silver and gold for the, the articles of the temple. It was the gold standard of the temple in, in the nation of Israel. Probably even the world, I would say, and, and the uh, grandeur of it. So there was some concern of it not being the same, but the Lord, we find no directive in the scriptures of the Lord telling them to build it like that nor to make it the same as the previous temple. He just tells them to build it because his house, of course, is a representation of his presence with his people. That's what he wanted. He was not worried about what it was going to look like because if we find out in the verses 6 through 9 uh, how he's going to glorify this, this coming temple, but then he says also in verse 8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. If he wanted it to have all those things, he would have brought it in. He would have supplied it for them, as was supplied on their departure from Egypt and their also their departure from Babylon. The people were lined with gold and silver and jewelry from the, inhabit and the uh, captors before they left those places, uh, left the captivity. So the Lord could have provided that and would have uh, set it forth, but he didn't do it. So they're sowing doubt among the young, and of course this is where the griping and grumbling come. And we as older folk, as we counsel younger folk, sometimes we have to be very careful of these things. We remember a day and time when it was grand or great, and so we must not put off the younger generation's or trying to uphold some standard of past history and applying that to today. To today. And so we have to be wary of this. It is, a, it is a message for all of us as we grow older. <clears throat> and of course, in their consideration, what's really going on? They're considering the externals. They're worried about some grand building and, and uh, temple and gold and silver and the pottery, and the dishes, and all that went into that. But that's not what the Lord was concerned with. They were not considering from the Lord's perspective. And we do that at times. We, we look at our church, or at other churches, well, they're so small, or they have just a little building, or they meet in a home. But does that mean that the Lord is not blessing them? 
Does it just because they have 10 people in the pew, does it not mean the Lord's not with them? We, we have to be very careful. We, we must consider what glorifies Him and also what He has commanded. We don't find any indication here that He's commanded them to make it like Solomon's. He had created men to amass that and get ready to build that temple. David in preparation of it and then his son Solomon. And, and so we, we see that there was preparations. There was no preparations here. He expected them just to obey. And of course, we know that God views things differently. He doesn't look on the external. That's us. He looks on the heart. He looks on the in, inward devotion, the spiritual things, as we learn in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16, verse 7. But let's look at this in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 27 and 28. <clears throat> Probably a well-known text. But it's wonderful that it goes with this because it shows what the Lord really is focused upon. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised. Hath, chosen, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. That's why the Lord doesn't look on the external and is not worried about such things. Because He operates, and when, when they are the base things of the world, what happens? He gets all the glory. When there are no resources, but resources come available, He gets the glory. When men and women go set about to do the work, and it's uh, this great work for His namesake, and everything takes place and happens as the Lord, as they're laboring for His sake. He gets the glory. That was the point. The glory of the Lord. Not at their hands. Not, not at the, the expense that this was, uh, as really the namesake says, we say Solomon's temple. But it would be His temple. And, and even, even so, they don't realize it. But this temple is not going to last long either. It will be destroyed too. Now, of course, don't, don't get confused with the temple in Christ's day. That was Herod's concoction. <clears throat> and that was not sanctioned by the Lord. That was him wanting to be a big head and prideful and build something grand to, for his uh, legacy, as we could say. That was not sanctioned by the Lord. And, of course, it was destroyed also by the Romans. But also in this, we see that this glory, and not to get ahead of ourselves, but that this glory has a future view in mind, too, that's even beyond the four walls of that foundation and that house they're building. And so we will look at that. And the problem we have here is, for us, in application, what? what? Well, one is, as we spoke of, as we grow older and we start to... Uh, look at, uh, fondly on old times going forward and with young we should uh, uh, be careful with our counsel as if we can maintain some form of the past in the present. Uh, we also here we find that doing we should never uh, compare ourselves spiritually to others. That's something we all do. It's easy. Well look at so and so. They pray three hours a day. Or they spend three hours a day in the scriptures. But yet, we need to be concerned about our own personal walk with Christ. Not with what everybody else is doing, or this church, or that church, or look at how the Lord's blessing them over there, and not us. We should be diligent in what the Lord has given us to do at that season. We are called to labor in our time and manner as the Lord has dictated. Also, we're called to labor in the, in the gifts that He's given us. Each and every one of us has a different gift. And He puts us into the body for that purpose where we are. Some are pinky fingers. Some are big toes. Some are the appendix. And what, what, do we, what does Paul say about that in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? It's the inferior ones that are the most important. What about your heart? It's not very big, 
but it's vital. And if you get struck in the heart, you're dead. But you can lose an arm, you can lose a leg, a foot, a hand, but not the heart or the brain. And they're enclosed behind bone and in certain areas to help protect. And so even the most inferior are still vital to the body. And so we, we labor in that with that in mind. Now, point number two, the, the here and now of the Lord's service. And we look at verses four and five. After dealing with their source of discouragement, Haggai now speaks to encouragement. The Lord knows our weak frames and sends support to us through his word. This helps us to continue laboring for his sake. It's, a, it's a, like a, a cool drink of water when we're, when we're sweating and, and uh, um, exercising our bodies. It's that little bit of refreshment or, or that first uh, bite of food after we have went a while without food. It, it energizes us. And so this is what he's giving to them. He's, he's propping them up. And we see that it's done through the promise of the Lord's presence. He says, I am with you. There in verse 4. Yet now be strong. And he lists all the, the leadership and then the people. The, the be strong there is an imperative. It's a command. And then we have also the, the command that's work there. So he says, be strong and work. I'm commanding you to. Now, what does this word be strong indicate? Well, it's not a physical strength necessarily. It's a, it's a prevailing. It's a be courageous as we see in other scriptures. In, in Joshua, this is said many times. Be strong and courageous. It's firm. It's not easily overthrown. They are, they are to uh, persevere in, in the work and the holding fast. And, and this is amid whatever obstacles it takes. Don't let the slightest things, the slightest road bumps or the slightest heels put you off. And that was what was the problem. And the work here is there to go about the Lord's service. And also included in that would be keeping his commands. So they've been commanded to work. Now they're jeopardizing that command by idling because of these statements being made about this house not being as glorious as the last. And in this command we have the performing our duties also. It's, it's the going forth in all that we've been given. And not letting things interrupt that. Now, why can they be strong? It's God's presence. It's the promise that he'll be with them. And this is a blessed promise. It's one that is given over and over in scriptures because we need to hear it often. That he is with us. Now, what does it mean being with them? It's a, it's a drawing near. The word with there means coming close into proximity, coming close, drawing close. He comes near to them. This is a personal relationship he has with his people. I, I find it striking in, in this, these two chapters that you find often, he doesn't call it the temple, he says my house. Well, in that, in that imagery of the word house, what do we find? It's like a family. There's a closeness. There's a familiarity with that family. And that echoes the sentiments that Paul uses in 1 Timothy when he talks about it's his house, how you ought to act in his house. This is why I write these things to you. And so that's what this is, is a personal relationship with his people. And in this, he hears their prayers and their cries. And they weren't even praying or crying at this point, but he heard and he knew and he sent his messenger. And how refreshing that is when we are seeking and maybe we have doubts or discouragements and we're reading the scriptures and he comes to us with a word and he applies it to our hearts he will not leave them nor forsake them in this personal relationship we also find that he sanctifies them he sent his uh, spirit it says in verse 5 my my spirit remaineth among you he accepts their repentance which he's already done they were at odds with him and then he uh, chastised them and they repented in the previous verses or the last verses of chapter 1 
So there's this continuing walk and, and personal relationship with their Lord. They are also delivered from their enemies with His presence. He's not going to let Satan or the world or sin or death keep them or have control over them. This is why He tells them, do not fear. And they did have enemies in the land. We talked about that in the previous uh, sermons. There was some obstacles that had arisen and there were some locals that were stirring up trouble against them because they wouldn't let them help build the temple. So they did have enemies. And then also in that day and age, you never knew when the current king would decide to send an army in and sweep everything away. So they did have concerns. But he is greater than their concerns. And his presence with them is what reminds them of that. He'll help in their labors, giving them knowledge and understanding. And we see that throughout the scriptures. He gave men knowledge and, and know-how and for all the working that in the original tabernacle and then the temple in Solomon's day. He gave all that, the resources, all of it. He was not going to leave them void and without. And you, dear friends, have the same promise today. If you were busy in his work, don't feel as if you're by yourself or stranded on a desert island. He's there with you. You can labor in his service without discouragement or fear. This is what our Lord does for us. The great creator of the universe who sits on the highest of thrones in heaven, but yet hears the cries of his people. He calls us in one place in Isaiah, do they not look to me as grasshoppers? But yet he hears us and he helps us. And we find that in this, it's reinforced by the word. He says in verse 5, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. And, and so within his word, we find contained his promises, the covenants. And so this is what we take hope in. And we see over and over again in this text, he, it, it keeps referring to him as the Lord of hosts. Saith the Lord of hosts, the one who is uh, king over all the armies in heaven and in earth. And we'll see more of that in the, in the last point when we're talking about the glory of this temple. But we see his control even over uh, creation itself and the men of creation. And so this is what reinforces their faith by his word. He sent it. And what's uh, even more interesting here is he doesn't refer to a, a time like the, them coming out of Babylon. What does he refer to? He refers to Egypt, to them coming out of the exodus of Egypt. Well, none of these men would have been alive during that time. Why would he refer to that? It's because he wants to show them the history that he was with his people all those years. That he has not left or nor forsaken them. Even when they were in Babylonian captivity, he was still with them. And still concerned for them. And brought them out. So he's setting forth this history of his continual faithfulness and trustworthiness. And so we, we take that in gladly and, and graciously because he is with his, with his fear. And we have the same thing today, dear friends. We can look throughout the scriptures. How, how many hundreds of years have went by from the oldest of these books and these words. And we have confidence because he was faithful then, he's faithful today. And he doesn't change. We have been given the same assurances. And this should dispel any fears that we have and strengthen our faith. And we see further that he strengthens this encouragement with, he, he wants them to maintain the correct perspective Going forward in verses 6 through 9, and he shows them, though you say this house is not as glorious as the old one, let me show you what I, how I'm going to glorify it. It's not going to be how you build it. It's going to be how I glorify it. And so he goes forward into that in these next few verses. The Lord uh, goes further with this, and he, they were worried about the external, but he shows them how he's going to glorify this grand temple, even when it's beyond when it doesn't sit anymore and the bricks are gone, the foundation is gone. I don't even know they know where in Israel this even sits. 
and archaeological standards, but still, this work, his work, is going forward. And we find in verses 6 through 7a that this is the Lord's work. It has to be his work. It's only his work. For in verse 6 it says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. And this shaking here is his doing, because he says, I will do this, and it will happen. Now what is the, the one little in the time designation? Now some say this refers to the coming Messiah, um, but the one little in grammatical standards is a single brief space till a series of mo uh, movements is to begin. So it's a brief moment. So it's not, uh, I think at this point I read commentators uh, estimate this is 517 years uh, before the Messiah is to be uh, incarnated. So this is a bit too long to say one little. But what's being referred here to is the empires of Greece and Rome and all the upheaval that was going to start very shortly among those empires and the wars and the, the uh, tumultuous times. And so we see that even here, the elements will be in flux because he is in control even of creation and nations. This is to show that the common things are not to be trusted. Those things which we experience each and every day are not to be trusted, and we know that. This afternoon, it's cloudy now, looks like it's going to rain. This could burn off and it could be 95 degrees. The weatherman says it might rain, but then it won't. And these things are constantly changing. Uh, recently, in the last week or two, Haiti has had a, a grand earthquake and mudslides. And then we read of fires out west. These, these are all things that change, and we can't establish any stability in them. It has men seeking for stability. And we, we know that. Even the carnal men, they seek for some form of peace. It's not true peace, but they seek it. And then with the nations, we see just recently, and we were talking about this before the service began, the Taliban, the Taliban rising again to power. And these are things. Those poor people, they, they're trying to get out on airplanes because they don't want to be under that rule when is a month ago they had something totally different. And yet men are desirous to seek stability. They don't want the turmoil and the chaos that comes along with some of those things. And we, of course, we have been blessed in the West that we've had relative stability and affluency, and yet many other desire that. Now, we see that this is the Lord's hand in these things. He's putting, putting these things in ter, uh, into flux so that men will look to Him or look for something greater than what's around us. And then we see that uh, verse the, the last part of verse 7 and verse 8, and he says, And the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. And so the, the desire of all nations there, there is some uh, controversy as to what that refers to. Many will say it's the Messiah coming. Um, some will say that it's only a literal translation. It's, it's him uh, the filling of the house with glory is in, in the Christ's earthly ministry, that he was in the, the temple preaching to the people and giving them the, the pure word of God. Um, but the thing is that several of these views are based on grammar, just to give you a quick overview of this without getting into too many details and burning all our time up. But there are different versions of this. And, and so, but, but the problem is that the grammatical views... It's with the tenses of the nouns and they're, they're, they're in agreeance. One's plural, one's singular. So it can't necessarily, if it's plural, it can't necessarily refer to a single entity as Christ. It has to refer to something else. But then you find in other verses, the desire, when desire is mentioned in the, in the column, the middle column, the scripture, the references, you'll find the desire is marked out and it says choice things or wealth of the Gentiles. Or wealth of the nations. 
And so there's some contextual issues with this, even with the, within verses 7 and 8. Why is he all of a sudden talking about the gold and silver being his, if this is referring to Christ, just the single Messiah shall come? Now, one commentator, it was a more practical commentator, a newer man, said that though the grammatical structure and the context don't match, that theology would say that the desire of all nations, of course, is Christ and, and the Messiah. So that would be theology within Trump grammar. I wasn't too satisfied with that answer, but I could see where he's stating that. I could understand where he's coming from. But I actually found that T.V. Moore, who is the Geneva series of commentaries on Haggai, had the best explanation. It was the best practical ex explanation. That what this is, is this is, this is there their to take stock of the whole gospel economy. That this glory and this desire, the desire is the wealth of the nations outside of Jerusalem, outside of Israel, which of course would be the Gentile nations. And that, that this would be uh, the, the Gentile wealth that would come into the church once the gospel spread beyond the borders of Jerusalem. And we have that, we meet with that even in today's standard, I mean, in, in today's uh, meeting of that prophecy that the Gentile churches are an overflow of wealth. And many of the Gentile churches were ones that sent William Carey and these men around the world. So this is about the advancement of the Lord's kingdom, the, the, the totality of it. Now, of course, the, there is connection to the Messiah because he is the, he is the groundwork, the foundation of that gospel. So it doesn't completely leave Christ out of, the, out of the mix. It just is showing this more from a wide view of this, the long view, as we were talking about earlier before the, the, the Bible study that the Taliban had on reconquering uh, Afghanistan. And so uh, this is what it's doing. Now, this is why they can labor. This is an encouragement that the Lord is advancing his kingdom and that they were going to be the means to help. And this is the same thing we take from it. We all labor for this end. We have the Great Commission. Now, on their day, they didn't have the Great Commission. They, had a, they were to build a temple that was an emblem of his presence with his people. And so in the laboring, this encouraged them because they knew that there was, sure, if, if surely through all from Egypt to then he was keeping his promise of being with them, that surely going forward the glory of this house would stand no matter what happened in the future. And we see that God will fill his house. He says, I will fill this house with glory. And this is not, of course, the external travesties, but spiritual that's what we come to understand. He, he will give it glory. It will give it meaning. It will be that which will uh, transcend even what they would understand as Jerusalem and Israel. And it will spread out into all the world to where we will meet with in Revelation. What does it say? That in, in that day with the, the slain lamb on, in chapter 5 on the throne, what happens? It says they all from every nation, tribe, tongue, were there singing before him. And that's what we're looking to. That is the big picture of the gospel economy. It will be greater than we can conceive because it'll be his glory. <clears throat> uh, this new house will be greater. It's uh, a surprising statement to them. This would have been, this would have put them off because the old ones are saying, well, I remember what Solomon's temple looked like. And here's the Lord saying, uh, in verse 9, this house will be greater. The total opposite, <clears throat> that paradox. And of course, this glory that's spoken of here, how will it be greater? Of course, one, it'll be His Spirit in those temples, those living temples. It's the glory of this house, the church, is the salvation of sinful men. It's the propagation of the gospel and the calling them forth. It's the bringing them out. And uh, he's talking about shaking in verse 6. What happens to, the, to men's lives in conversion? Their whole world is shaken. Everything they know to come and know and, and to rely upon is now shaken to the foundation of nothing. 
This is what he's talking about, the being the glory of this latter house. This, of course, goes to all men. It's a, this is why we encourage the work. It's, it's a temple not made with hands, as it's said in other places. Because it's His. He's building it. And, of course, as we preach and, and witness the gospel, what do we know? We have these grand promises also to that. What does it say in John 10? My sheep will hear my voice. Not the voices of men. Those are the perverse shepherds. But they'll hear my voice and come forward. That's why we preach. We don't have to worry about gimmicks to get men in the door or to change their lives. It will be done because he says he will do it. And this, of course, this new glorious temple, it's made without hands, but what, would it be, what will it be full of? And, and First Peter tells us this, it's full of precious and lively stones. Each and every one who comes to him in salvation. Not only will this be full of, of glory because the Lord will glorify it and it will be better than Solomon's, we find also this will be a house of peace. True peace. Not the peace sold to us by the world. Temporary peace that falters and, and comes crashing down. This is the peace that's established by the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. Now how is this peace established by Christ? It's with His blood. It's what gives us, uh, we, we can be reconciled to God. It breaks down that wall, that partition between us. It also brings us peace of conscience. We're no longer shamed and guilt because of our sin and our carnal appetites. This is what He establishes for us. The blood, and this is what I was talking about, we can't cut the Messiah out of this, even if you don't take that to be the desire of all nations, but He's still there, He's still present, because that's how the Lord has established it. We can't have one without the other. And of course, this peace we know will surpass all knowledge. It will surpass the knowledge of even the greatest men in the world, because it's simple. It's that which confounds the wise, as we read earlier. But yet, he has established it that way. They were looking back at something that was no longer present. But the Lord shows them that it will be greater in the future. And all they had to do is rely on that and his presence with them. And there will be times in your service to the Lord where you become discouraged, just like the Israelites. We're all carnal men. We're all cut out of the same flesh. We get discouraged. We hit obstacles and, and turn and sit for a minute and say, Oh, Lord, you know, why can't the path be easy and light? But yet, He has established it that way. It's His providence. But in His providence, if He gives us those times, He doesn't desert us. He doesn't leave us to ourselves in our own strength. The task and circumstances may become daunting, but uh, we, we take, uh, and especially this happens when we take our eyes off of the Lord and we begin to look around us. That's what they had truly done. They were too worried about the, the man-made stuff instead of looking to Him. Don't despair. Remember who it is we serve. The covenant-keeping God who promises to be with us and never forsake us. And what a grand promise that is. His presence has been with His people from, from since the beginning of those who call upon Him. He will never leave nor leave us to ourselves. Remember for what cause we labor. He's with us, but then we labor for this great and grand gospel that's saving men, that's bringing them into the church all over the world. Don't feel like you're not a part of that. Maybe it's your lot just to pray. Not all of us are built to go overseas or circumstances to go overseas, but it doesn't mean we can't pray. It doesn't mean we can't help and give to those support those who are laboring in those fields. We all have a part to play, even if it just seems like the most insignificant. We have a part. God has graciously made us partakers in laboring for the advancement of the kingdom. He will glorify His church as He brings in poor, helpless sinners. 
uh, into this building, this temple that is made without hands and is constructed with precious living stones. Amen. And let us pray. O oh God, we come before thee. We do acknowledge thou thy great church. This, this house that thou has placed here on earth where we can come together as believers and thou art working among us and drawing men and women unto thee. We, we thank thee for thy gospel that saves men, that, that blood-stained gospel that washes us white as snow. And we do pray that thou would help us when we falter, lift us up, be with us and comfort us, we ask that thou would equip us and, and make us diligent in thy labors for this gospel's sake, that that may be our attention each and every day, that we may look and seek whom we may minister to for thy name's sake. And we do pray this in the name of our Savior and for his sake. Amen.